if you've ever heard it said, I grew up a stone's throw from here, that would be very applicable to my life. I wouldn't necessarily be the one throwing the stone, but if you'll get one of the members of your baseball team to stand in the front of Gardner Center or the old Paul Gray Hall, they could probably launch a rock across the Henderson Church Building parking lot and landed at what was 235 2nd Street. For some reason over the years, they've changed to 237 2nd Street. <laughs> Didn't know Henderson had grown that much. <laughs> but I grew up here, my parents moved here in the middle of my first straight year. My dad became the preacher for the Henderson Church of Christ for the next 12 years. And three days after I graduated from high school, I moved to Texas. Come back many times, bringing young people to Mid-South Youth Camp and being a part of here and even having my own kids to be a part of this student body. And it's good to be back here. What I know in life, I learned so very much here in Henderson. This was where I had my first real education. This is where I first made friends. This is where I first gave a speech in fourth grade in the 4-H speech contest at the urging of Miss Swift, who's still alive, and I'm so very proud uh, to say, uh, helped me get going in this journey that I've had in my life. I remember winning the fourth grade speech contest down in the courthouse, where I was awarded not only a trophy that was a, a pretty nice small trophy, but I was awarded a check for three dollars. <laughs> I would like to say I still have that check, but I'm pretty sure I cashed it and spent it. I also won an apron making contest. Yes, the man standing before you sewed his own apron. The one thing I could never accomplish, the one thing I could never do growing up was to beat Kathy Manus Maples in the bread baking competition. And President Shannon, I'd like for you to utilize your vast resources if you've been to do an investigation on that and see if she was using any kind of products or ingredients that would not have uh, been legal at the time. Uh, I have not yet to explain how it was that she could do a, a buttermilk biscuit or a, a cornmeal muffin better than I did. I just thought I had that wit, but she beat me every time. I remember those times growing up, making all those friends to which I am very loyal to this day. I live in Central Florida. I live about an hour south of Orlando where it is much warmer than it is here. But I still drive a Lofton Chevrolet pickup. I still drive a Lofton Chevrolet car. I drive all the way to Tennessee just to both Spence and Kermit, who used to go to school here as well, now run their mom and daddy's business, and so I'm very loyal to them. I made a lot of good friends here. I had the world's greatest youth minister. Can you get any better than David Powell? He was my youth minister. High school quarterback star was my youth minister. But you know, when you grow up, you make mistakes too. You make mistakes and you make enemies. I would like to say that I've made a lot more friends in my life than enemies, but there were times when I upset people. Most of the time it was due to things that I said carelessly or things that I did without much thought. And when I was able to, I tried to make those right. But sometimes I had enemies simply because of who I was. I would like to say that growing up, my significance as a Christian bore a lot of that weight, but being the son of Max Patterson in Henderson, Tennessee was a big deal. I tell preacher's kids, I say, you haven't been a preacher's kid till you've been a preacher's kid in Henderson, Tennessee because there were a lot of expectations that were put on me, a lot of things I resented, a lot of times when people would leave me out of the mix simply because of who my daddy was. And I even had some people who didn't like him to the point that it got taken out on me. And I remember thinking to myself, I'd like to pray an imprecatory prayer towards you. I'd like to sing an imprecatory song. How many of you had that feeling before? Go ahead, raise your hand. That you just really wanted to pray an imprecatory prayer or sing an imprecatory song. Go ahead, raise your hand up real high. Because now we're going to ask you what does the word imprecatory mean? <laughs> it's not a word that I use in my daily life. But it's very interesting that there are a series of psalms that are called the imprecatory psalms. 
And that word imprecatory is an adjective form of a, of a word that means to call down evil or a curse upon somebody else. And I'm sitting there thinking, really? The Psalms have those kinds of sayings in them? Well, they do. You see, we think about Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You make me to lie down in green pastures. It's such a good psalm. Hey, that's the, that's the book where we get as a deer. Hands for the water, so my soul longs after you. These are great psalms. We see psalms of thanksgiving, and I can almost guarantee you, you heard some of those read just last week, maybe in a lesson or a devotion. There are psalms of, re of repentance. Uh, there are psalms of joy. There are psalms of praise and glory to God. But then you have these psalms that are imprecatory. Let me give you an example. I actually hope that you have your electronic device open because what Mr. Scott read to you, read just a moment ago was one of those psalms. Now you may not have recognized it from the first five verses because the first five verses are like a lot of the psalms. And in this case, we see David who is lamenting over the struggles he's got, being a, a, a follower of God, being a man after his own heart. David had a lot of enemies. David had people who didn't like him. David had people in his own family who sought ill toward him. Well, here is one of those situations, and, and you, you read the first five verses, and maybe you're not aware of what's about to happen, the transition that's about to take, because he's talking about the wicked are against me. They've spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have words of hatred. Uh, in return for my love, they act as my accusers. They have repaid me evil for good and hatred for love. And that happens to a lot of God's people. But then what happens next in this song that he's writing, in essence, this prayer set to music that David is delivering to the Almighty, he then says this, appoint a wicked man over him. You know that, those people that have been hurt me, that guy that's been against me, appoint a wicked man over him and let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is judged, let him come forth guilty and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few. Let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. How many of you have prayed that kind of prayer recently? <laughs> let my enemy die and let his children be orphans and let his wife be a widow. How many of you have prayed that prayer? Do you really expect that out of anybody who is following righteousness and especially a man called a man after God's own heart? Let his children wander about and beg and let them seek sustenance far from their ruined homes. Let the creditor seize all that he has, and let strangers plunder the product of his labor. Let there be none to extend loving kindness to him, nor any to be gracious to his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off. In a following generation, let their name be blotted out. Anybody pray that kind of prayer with me? Anybody sing that kind of song with me? I think a lot of times when we look at our relationship with God, we look at it at, as in one of two ways, and both ways are sometimes very extreme. One way is we look at him as the Almighty. We look at him as deity. We look at him as someone who is so far removed from who we are that it's almost impossible. It's certainly difficult to fathom that we could have a relationship with him, much less that he'd want to have a relationship with us. But at the same time, we also sing songs like, what a friend we have in Jesus. And that is indeed true. God is our friend. God is our father, but God is our friend. He has loved us so much. He loves us so much. He will continue to love us so much. So much is his love for us that he sent his only son to die in our stead. But when we think about those two extremes, is there possibly a way that we can have a little bit of middle ground? Could we have that same awe and respect for him 
and realize how close he wants to be with us? You see, I'm not going to try to explain to you all the imprecatory songs and what they mean. I'm going to leave that to your Old Testament teachers. Some people think that it was a reminder to the Jews about their need to repent. Some a reminder of the extremes that are in this world. And you're either with God or you're against them. And you can be with them and, and be blessed or you can be against them and be cursed. But either way, you want to make a decision. But I want to say that God did not, when he inspired men to write these books of the Bible, God did not make them write things. He didn't have them write things against their will. Obviously, at some point in time, this is how David does. I want to ask you the question, have you ever felt overwhelmed? Have you ever felt afraid? Have you ever felt lost or alone? You see, I preached a sermon several years ago when I lived in Missouri, and I talked about several characters in the Bible, characters who didn't exactly talk to God the way we think we're supposed to talk to God, the way we think we should talk to God. In fact, these were men who said, God, I'm all alone. Nobody's here with me. Oh, look at all these problems. Think about Moses and all the times he was complaining because of the whining, griping, complaining Israelites. Think about Elijah. He stands before 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of the Asherah, and where are his people? Where are his people, the Israelites? They're over here on the side, waiting to see who wins the battle, and then they'll make a decision. Think about Ezekiel. Before the Valley of the Dry Bones, when God demonstrates that he can create an army out of anything he wants to, if you just remember who's in charge. I want you to think about some of those people in the Old Testament that they, they, they kind of cried. They whined. They complained. They didn't fully understand the big picture. They were only interested or seemingly seeing the microcosm of their world. But I preached that sermon and I said, you know, God wants to hear everything that we have to say. Not just the good and the good times. He wants to hear the bad and the bad times. And I had a lady come up to me after services and she said, I didn't know we could pray like that. I didn't know that we could talk to God like that. And certainly we're not talking about disrespecting God, but telling God what's on our hearts. Telling God what, what's on our, in our lives. What's going on in our world. Are there professors here at Freedom Harvard University who are so evil that they would assign you homework over Thanksgiving break? <laughs> are there such people? Talk to God about it. Do you happen to have one of those days when you have five tests and they just kind of all collided at the same time? Talk to God about it. Is your relationship with your boyfriend or your girlfriend not quite going the way you would like to? And and you're trying to deal with that while balancing life, balancing school, balancing your faith. Talk to God about it. Are you having struggles with your parents, with your family? Maybe you just came off of Thanksgiving break and you just had a blast. You had a great time. But there are some times when people go home and that's, that's a struggle. Because this is that transition in life where you're going un from underneath mom and dad's roof to your own independence. Talk to God. Talk to Him. Because He is deity. He is the Creator. He is the Almighty. He is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. But He also wants to be your friend. He doesn't want to be a distant father in this relationship. He wants to be close to you. He wants to be there by your side. He wants to walk with you at times carry you if need be. Realize that you may go through struggles with people, kind of like David did in his life, where the first impulse may be, I want to get back at them. They hurt me, I want to hurt them back. They said something about me, I want to say something about them and made it up it just a little bit. I think that's normal. But God wants better for us. And one of the ways that we can accomplish that 
is we can have a better relationship with Him. Because I promise you, if you have a better relationship with God, if you have a better friend in Jesus, everything else works out better. Everything else falls in its proper place. I'd like to say that I'm, as, I'm still as young as I used to be. I'm not. I'm growing up. I'm certainly a little older than some of you, but not as old as all of you. But one of the things that I'm learning in life is I'm learning to slow down and just take a breath. Breathe. Remember when something happens to you, it's not the worst thing in the world. When somebody says something about you, it doesn't necessarily deserve a response. But I'm also trying to remember that God is ever with me. He wants me. And he wants to talk with me. And I want to talk with him. Hopefully as I continue to grow up, I'm going to be able to do that better. So that I can indeed walk and talk with my creator. Deism. My heavenly father. And in so doing, I'll be much better off in this life as a result. I appreciate you very much being able to spend this morning with you. And it's my understanding that at this point in time, I'm the one that gets to say, go to lunch. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you.